Welcome to what I think will be a fascinating, interesting, and always provocative talk by a very famous guy, Ed Bars. Uh, but, but, but before we start, I, I, I want to take this opportunity to digress. First off, my name is Bob Kirby. I'm the superintendent here. And, uh, and I have a little personal story about Ed. It, it underscores his incredible memory. About, oh, I'd say more than 30 years ago, I was a ranger in San Francisco, and the regional chief historian, a guy named Gordon Chappelle, said, the man who wrote the historic structures report for Alcatraz, at the time I was a district ranger at Alcatraz, and uh, the guy who also wrote the historic structures report for Fort Point is coming to the Fort Mason Officers Club, and would you like to join us for dinner? And I said, well, sure, cool, yeah, that'd be great. So we went to dinner, uh, and I was somehow awestruck right away and intimidated by this incredible man. And I, and I sat through the whole dinner, and I'll bet I didn't say two words the whole time. And uh, I felt a little sheepish, but then I, I didn't embarrass myself too much, did I, Ed? So 30 years later, I was the superintendent down at Petersburg National Battlefield, and the Historian there, a guy named Chris Calkins, says, Hey, a friend of mine's coming to town. His name is Ed Bars. Would you like to go to lunch with us? I go, Oh, okay. I've done this. <laughs> so I went to lunch, and we met at Longstreet's Cafe, and there was Ed. And I, and, I, and I was absolutely sure that he didn't remember me. It had been 30 years, and I'd, I'm sure my hair had gone from brown to, to the gray it was at the time. And I walked up and I said, hello, Mr. Bars, my name is Bob Kirby. Uh, I, had, I, I met you one time. And he goes, oh, of course I met you one time. And he proceeds to tell the story about the dinner at the, at the Fort Mason Officers Club 30 years before. He recounts what we talked about, and he recounts even what I had to eat. <laughs> Unbelievable. No, I couldn't refute him because I couldn't remember any of that stuff. <laughs> but anyway, let me get started. No more of me here. Let me talk about this wonderful man. With an encyclopedic memory and lots of energy, Ed Bars has been bringing history to life on the Civil War battlefields across the nation for visitors of all ages as Chief Historian Emeritus for the National Park Service. Mr. Barr started his interpretive touring as part of his official duties with the National Park Service in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and went on to do a, annual tours for the prestigious Chicago Civil War Roundtable. And through well into his 80s, he continues to lead numerous tours, traveling as many as 200 days per year around the United States, the Pacific, and Europe, routinely outpacing younger visitors over rough terrain, while recreating famous infantry and cavalry attacks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and a privilege for me to introduce to you Ed Bars. It's a great experience uh, being at Gettysburg on the 150th anniversary of the great battle and uh, sharing a few thoughts on the Battle of Gettysburg. The subject of my talk is going to be General Meade. the unappreciated hero of the Battle of Gettysburg. A man that will not be properly appreciated by the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Army. General Meade had been a, a lifelong soldier he had been a good corps commander and uh, loyal to the army leadership and such. Now he goes to bed on the evening of the 27th day of June, not knowing 
what is going to happen to him during the night. The Union Army is concentrated in and around Frederick, Maryland. The commander of the Army, fighting Joe Hooker, is going to have written two message, uh, um, communicate with the Secretary of War that day on the 27th and informs them unless you place the troops under General French in and around Harper's Ferry under my command, I'm going to request to be relieved of commander of the Army of the Potomac. The Army of the Potomac had marched hard to reach Frederick Maryland. He had pushed, Hooker had pushed his men harder than General Lee had in moving his army northward from Culpeper County. And since the uh, 23rd day of June, General Lee, with two of his three corps, had been concentrated in and around Chambersburg. 23 miles west of where we are. One corps of General Lee's army is in York, has one division in York and two divisions in Carlisle. Of course, Jeb Stewart is off on his right around McClellan, and unfortunately for Lee, they're not in touch with each other. Hooker says, if you do not give me my way, I resign. The President of the United States, the Chief Army, the Chief of Staff, are, the General in Chief are enthused with that. They wanted Hooker to resign. And it takes them less than uh, 10 minutes to decide who will get the task of engaging the heretofore all but invincible Robert E. Lee, who has led an army that is used to winning. And unlike when he went north to Maryland in 18, in September of 62, there are no stragglers in the Army of Northern Virginia when it crosses the Potomac. They've beaten the Union at Fredericksburg and beaten them badly at Chancellorsville. They're confident that their 75,000 men, when and if they meet the Army of the Potomac, will have no trouble dealing with them. So they give the message to Major Hardy, a, sta a, a War Department functionary, and he heads out by special train to Frederick. And He's met at, uh, at Monocacy Junction by a staff officer and is guided to Meade's headquarters, which are at Bucky's Town. And he awakens Meade in the middle of the night. Meade is a cadaverous fellow, probably not looking very handsome in his nightshirt, as he gets up and learns that he's been appointed to command the Army of the Potomac. He knows little about where they are, except for the units of the Fifth Corps. And he'll write his wife that evening of the 28th and said he's been sentenced and convicted without a trial. <laughs> he is informed by Hardy, the, Re the War Department, the President will not accept his declination. If he declines, he would have to resign. So he accepts command of the army. A challenge that few men in our military have ever been called on, knowing they're only two days march from Lee's army, all but invincible. So Meade will take command 
on the morning of the 28th. He decides we're not going to move today. We're going to find out where everybody is. All our, our 94,000 men. And he decides maybe I better get rid of General Butterfield. He's not only a hooker crony, but he's a chief of staff. And you better make sure your chief of staff is loyal to you, not loyal to somebody else. So he tries to get a new chief of staff. Warren would say, when he's approached, I prefer the job of chief engineer. He will contact his good friend, A.A. Humphreys. Humphreys is a division commander in the Third Corps. But he says, I like to command troops in battle. I don't want to be a paper shuffler. So Meade will make his one bad decision, and he'll regret it all his life. He'll retain General Butterfield, a New York lawyer, and a crony of Joe Hooker as his chief of staff. On the 29th, Lee will put his army in motion. He will have, operating in the left wing of his army, will be the cavalry commanded by General Buford and the army's left wing commanded by his fellow Pennsylvanian, General Reynolds, with three brigade, with three corps. The first corps commanded by Reynolds. The ninth corps, the, the eleventh corps commanded by General Howard, in whom General Meade has little confidence. And the third corps commanded by General Sickles. Now Meade looks at Sickles the same as these women in the audience look at O.J. Simpson. <laughs> A man who is not only a politician, but a man who has got away with murder. <laughs> he sees he's used the system to be found innocent by temporary insanity. And if you look close at the case, Sickles entrapped Barton Key, but no one knows it at the time. So, he, uh, so Reynolds will command the Army's left wing, and some 35 miles to the east will be the Army's right wing, which will, is commanded by General Sedgwick. On the 29th, the Union Army begins to close on the Maryland-Pennsylvania line. On the morning, uh, uh, and on the 30th, Reynolds's men and Buford's men crossed the Pennsylvania line. Now, if General Lee would have been there, he would have worried a little bit. Why? The Union troops, particularly Pennsylvanians, more than anybody else, of which one-third of Meade's army ails from the state of Pennsylvania. And as they head north and cross the Pennsylvania line, the bands swing out, they, they encase their colors, and the steps have more spring in it. They find the women looking better in Pennsylvania. <laughs> the fields more lush than in Maryland or Virginia. They can feel that now they're fighting because those Confederates are invading their homes and hearts. That big advantage the Confederates had when the Yankees are south of the Potomac River, that those SOBs are down here. So there's an intangible that Lee Meade undoubtedly senses as he crosses into Pennsylvania. On the evening of the 30th, he will prepare his Pipe Street 
circular, which will indicate that if we, as we move into Pennsylvania on this broad front and encounter the Confederates at a place where the terrain favors them, we will fall back and take position along the Pipe Creek line, a stream flowing from east to west, just south of the, of the Maryland-Pennsylvania line. If you don't like General Meade, and uh, you're going to say he's showing a defeatist concept, because Meade's orders are the same as General McClellan. When Meade took command of the Army of the Potomac, he is to cover Washington and Baltimore, search out the enemy, and give the enemy battle, and the same as McClellan was, beat the enemy and don't let them return to Virginia. So if used right by certain people, we'll mention later, it looks like Meade may have a problem similar to General McClellan. As we know, the armies will contact each other uh, and the first shots will be exchanged on the morning of the first day of of uh, of, of July out near Marsh Creek where that road will take you to the home of little horses when Marcellus Jones a lieutenant in the 8th Illinois Cavalry, barges Sergeant Schaefer's Sharps carbine and takes a shot at those horsemen coming out of the fog as they rise out of Marsh Creek. Doesn't hit anyone. And if it hadn't been followed by the Battle of Gettysburg, no one would remember that shot. And there would be no first shot marker out there, which Marcellus Jones and six of his comrades will erect in 1896. That will lead to the, the, uh, to the battle. Hubert will play his role well, holding the enemy at bay, and Meade will be called on to make an important decision. Meade is at Tawny Town, and two Union Corps will engage the enemy as General Hill, A.B. A. Hill, has made a terrible error. His error is by sending 15,000 men to find out who is in Gettysburg. Lee's orders are very specific. He wants his army to concentrate on Cashtown Gap and does not want a battle until his army is concentrated. So the battle will begin, and it will rage throughout a good part of the day. On day one, the Union is doing better and doing passable. Now Meade is back at Tawnytown, waiting to hear. About 12 o'clock, a messenger arrives that General Reynolds is on the field and has moved to Buford's support over on Seminary Ridge. A half an hour later, a messenger arrives from Reynolds, uh, and this early message undoubtedly sounds like Winston Churchill on the 10th day of, the, uh, of uh, May 1940, when he replaces the Umbrella Man as a Prime Minister of England. That's one reason I never use an umbrella. <laughs> I associate it with appeasement and Neville Chamberlain. Churchill will tell, Reynolds will state, this is a place to fight a battle. The best artillery position in the area. If driven from the ridges west of town, 
I will barricade the streets of town and fight them in the streets. Much like Churchill says, we'll fight them in the beaches, we'll fight them in the streets. And they do. Next he learns that Reynolds is dead. A half hour later, and Howard is in command. Meade and Natalie will say, oh, and that word begins with S and ends with T. <laughs> Knowing that Reynolds, that, uh, that the 11th Corps has been routed at the Battle of Chancellorsville. So the, so the Confederates, by the end of the day, will have won the first day's battle. But what does Meade do at noon? He calls in General Hancock. Hancock's the superb. He's going to make an important decision. He's going to tell Hancock to proceed to Gettysburg, assess the situation, and decide if Reynolds, who is now deceased, is right and is a place we should fight a battle. So General Meade is having to make a difficult decision. So he sends the man he can count on most of all, and he'll ride up to Cemetery Ridge, excuse me, Cemetery Hill, arrive a little after four o'clock when he sees the 11th Corps and many elements of the 1st Corps driven through the streets of Gettysburg, assembling on Cemetery Hill. Reynolds, uh, Hancock will make one decision immediately. No one is on Corpse Hill, and he'll order Wadsworth to take his corps and get his tail up onto Corpse Hill. Wadsworth will procrastinate, and Hancock will say, you didn't hear me right. After a long discussion with Meade, with Howard, in which Hancock controls his temper, They'll agree and send me the message. This is where we should fight a battle. They've seen that this is the best, a far better position than anyone on the, on the uh, Pipe Creek line. East Cemetery Hill is the best artillery position in the entire area. And off gallops a messenger down to tell General Meade that. Later on, Hancock will proceed there, and by that time, Meade has ordered the army to concentrate at Gettysburg. So Meade has now scrubbed the Pike Creek circular and is going to fight the battle, and it's a defensive battle he is going to fight at Gettysburg, anchored on Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, Cemetery Ridge. Meade is there by midnight, and he's by the, by the, by the Sexton's quarters in the cemetery, in Evergreen Cemetery. When a private will come up to him, and privates are more daring than officers, and he's going to ask General Meade, are we going to fight here? And Meade says, yes, I've ordered the entire army to assemble here. Now the Confederates are having their time of it. Now Meade, Lee is overconfident. And he decides and will tell General, and will decide if the enemy is there in the morning, and there I mean to attack him, and there I mean to beat him. So, uh, so the Union Army will take up its position as, as depicted on the prime map. A member of the Warren's engineer staff, and according to this, the Third Corps under General Sickles is to anchor his right near the Pennsylvania Monument and extend along Seminary, Cemetery Ridge uh, to the area where the Millertown Road, i.e. Wheatfield Road, crosses it. 
But Sickles, as a small core, two divisions rather than three, he doesn't like the position. And over without uh, getting Meade's sanction and getting uh, a, a decision on Meade to stay where he is, he will advance up to the sickle salient. Now, when Longstreet begins, as Longstreet prepares for his attack after his long march at four o'clock, Meade will find out what Sickles has done and he'll be very unhappy about it. Sickles says, I withdraw my men. Sickles says, the enemy won't give you time. Rejoin your corps. And Meade immediately orders Warren to Little Round Top to see if anyone is there. When Reynolds, when Warren gets there, he sees only a score of Signal Corps people are there. I'm not deprecating the Signal Corps, but if you have a score of Signal Corps people there, the Confederates are going to have Little Round Top like a cakewalk. Meade will then order General Sykes to take his third corps, and the battle will rage throughout the afternoon, uh, from four o'clock till around seven o'clock. And uh, Warren uh, Longstreet will say it's the best three hours of fighting that his men do during the war, but they do not seize Little Roundtop. They're unable, they're able to reach Cemetery Hill, but Lee does not kick butt among his subordinates, either A.P. Hill or Dick Anderson, and the Confederates fail that day. Meade will be there, and Meade will even lead a, troops in. So Lee show, Meade will show that he can be an activist at times as a crisis builds. Now Meade is going, Meade will make his big mistake. He is going to meet with his staff. Meade at the end of the fighting on day two will send a message to Washington. The battle, it's been terrible fighting today, but he believes the final results generally favor us. We hold the key ground. Cemetery Ridge, Little Round Top, most of Culp's Hill, except for a toll. And he then makes an error. He calls a consul, he calls a meeting which Butterfield, no friend of his, will convert into a council of war in which they will decide three questions. Do we, do we stay here? After long discussion, they vote stay here. Then the next question, since we stay here, do we attack the enemy? or let them attack us. The vote is, again, almost unanimous. We let them attack us. The final vote will have no d decision. We'll meet again tomorrow to to on the evening of the third, and that is, what do we do if the enemy doesn't attack us? Now, when, when the meeting breaks up, General Meade calls General Gibbon aside. Gibbon will command the Second Corps, since Hancock commands the left wing. And he says, General Meade is attacked, General Lee is attacked by right yesterday. That's Longstreet. They've attacked my left. That's Allegheny Johnson. And they have failed. Therefore, watch out. They're going to attack the center today. And he also tells his men before the disperse, we're going to take the offensive at one point tomorrow 
We're going to kick the Confederates off their foothold on Culp's Hill. By 11 o'clock, the Confederate foothold on Culp's Hill has been eliminated. The only Confederates on Culp's Hill are dead, wounded, and prisoners. We have the great artillery bombardment. Meade's headquarters are the most difficult place to be. Meade will move his headquarters to Powers Hill. And as you, if you participated in the ceremonies on the 3rd, which I was privileged to do, and I may have been the only 90-year-old that made the march on the 3rd. which I did. It was a pleasure and a thrill to do it uh, because I see that as a connection between the men that fought here and myself as a veteran of World War II because I was wounded badly just 70 years before. So I was uh, 20 years older than when I was wounded when I walked it on on the third. And we, uh, so we have the, uh, yes, Marine Corps, hurrah. The, the Marine Corps didn't use hurrah then, they copied it from the Army along about uh, uh, in the Vietnam conflict. So, the biggest charge will be repulsed. It begins raining very hard. And on the 3rd, on the 4th, the Union, the Confederates pull back, abandon the town, and withdraw their left so Lee can begin his retreat on the evening of the 4th. During the day, on the 4th, Meade makes a horrible error. In our days, every officer, even a corps commander, will have a PR man on his staff. Those days, you didn't have PR men on your staff, and the press was usually your enemies, and many did not get along with the press well. So he d issues a, grand, uh, a congratulatory communication to his men on the force. And he will congratulate them on beating, defeating, mauling General Lee's army. Then calls on them, and these are what he should never have written. Now, he probably didn't write this order. It was probably written by Chief of Staff Butterfield, but Meade is responsible for it. His final sentence will be, he calls on them for further exertions to drive the invaders from our soil. And that hits the president the wrong way. The president explodes in front of his uh, secretary, Secretary A, and he will say, my God, my God, what does that man mean? It's all our soil. So Meade has begun to squander the goodwill you would think the commander in chief should have it for him because he had won the bloodiest battle, a battle that will take the very heart and soul out of Lee's army. He will, he, will, he will, the cavalry will pursue on the night of the 4th and on the 5th, joined by Sedgwick's men, and they'll pursue, proceed a short distance. On the 7th, Meade will move his army southward to Frederick. 
He needs to resupply his army. On the 5th, he had one piece of good luck. He had fired General Butterfield. And Henry Haupt, a classmate of his, had arrived and will personally visit Lincoln and inform him that he believes Meade is dogging it. He has supplies and he thinks he should pursue. Worse yet is happening in Washington. On the evening of the 5th, President Lincoln and Tad, the most hyperactive child you would have ever heard of, visit Daniel Edgar Sickles. Sickles would had his leg amputated by Dr. Sy on the evening of the 2nd and 3rd is in Washington on the 5th. Lincoln and Tad call on him. They're sitting in an easy chair with his right leg propped up, bandaged, bloody is Dan Sickles. And as Tad bounces around there, you'll tell the president, if I had not advanced my men up to the peach orchard, Meade would have fallen back on the evening of the second and there would have been no day three. And the president swallows it like a trout with a good fly. <laughs> and, Sickles, and Sickles has scored a coup on General Meade. Worse on the seventh, a telegram arrives telling all about the wonderful things my predecessor said that General Grant reports on the 4th. Now, the telegram from Grant has to go up the river to Cairo, Illinois, then by telegraph, so it doesn't reach Washington until the evening of the 7th. And, uh, and that upsets the president again. He thinks, and he'll send a message to Meade that if you just push the enemy hard, you're going to do the same thing that General Grant did. The Confederate Army will not get across the Potomac River and the war will be over. So Meade's standing is now getting rather sticky with the president. Lee, when he reached the Potomac River, finds it in flood. It's impossible to use the Ford at, uh, 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 use the Ford uh, up, uh, up at uh, 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 the Ford and the Confederate Potton Bridge at uh, Falling Waters has been destroyed and the river falling. And Meade, Meade begins moving up. Now, Lee, as he waits for the river to crest and fall, which it will begin doing by the, the thir, uh, by the 12th, they have, they have, the, the, they, the Confederates, Meade will send the president a message. And that will make the president smile. He has scheduled an attack on Lee's lot, defense line which Lee has thrown up covering his bridgehead. And, uh, and uh, Meade has scheduled an attack on the Confederate defenses for the 13th. It begins raining again on the 13th. And Meade decides that he will have a meeting He'll call another accursed consul of war. And he's going to ask his generals, in view of the rain, should we attack? This is on the evening of the 13th. And they will vote five to two against attacking. When Meade sends this message to Halleck, 
the president as a tizzy and tells Alec to let me know that the president is very, very unhappy. So Halleck will write a message and tell Maid, you did wrong in calling a council of war. Take counsel of your own fears. It's proverbial that a council of war never fights. So Lincoln is Doug of uh, Meade is getting in deeper with the president. On the evening of the 13th, Lee begins the water having fallen up at the ford. His men begin crossing. They have rebuilt a potten bridge, the pottens, throw them down river, and they're crossing at falling waters. The Union Army at Meade will then order an attack for the night, uh, for the uh, for the 13th, night of the 13th and 14th. As the Union arrive, they find they're too late. So they do inflict sizable casualties on the Confederates as they cross at Falling Waters. They get across the river and the president is beside himself. He will write out a message. Now, Lincoln, Meade will never, will hear about this, he never sees it. Because the president will think further about it. It is that you had him in your hands. Speaking of Lee and his army, and all they had to do was close them, and you would have had him. And the president will tear it up and throw it in the garbage can. Meade, on, uh, Halleck on the 15th, will then send a message to Meade informing him that the president is very, very disappointed in you because you let the enemy escape across the Potomac River. In one and a half hours, Meade has responded. He says, it is, it's, it's, it, the president has censored me. I request that he accept my resignation as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Halleck then, at the direction of the president, has to eat crow and back off and said, uh, you really didn't understand what the president meant. He didn't mean it as a strong words of censorship of you. And me being the good soldier he is, does not uh, withdraws his request to be relieved. So we have General Meade. Think of what he did. Took command of the army on the morning of the 28th. One week later, what he had done he had not only beaten Bobby Lee, he had, he had mauled him. He inflicted casualties on him, which the Confederates can never sustain. Never again will the Army of the Potomac initiate a major campaign against the Army of the Potomac. Then, Add another, uh, add another, uh, uh, add another 10 days to that. And he writes a, no, uh, a letter in which undoubtedly, if the president hadn't retreated in the position, General Meade would have resigned. Because he, he submitted. 
he he does it, but the Alec has to withdraw it. So, uh, so General Meade has very few monuments to him. General Meade becomes, when Grant becomes general in chief, practically a forgotten man. The Park Service used to have a sign that I only got removed when I was chief historian at Appomattox that said that on the ninth, on the ninth day of April, General Lee surrendered to General Grant and the Army of the Potomac. No mention that General Meade still commanded the Army of the Potomac. So uh, I used to uh, uh, not really appreciate General Meade as much as you may gather from my talk today. And since I probably made some controversial statements, uh, General Lee did not fight a very good battle here. And that works bad for General Lee, uh, General Meade, because Meade fights a good battle here. Why don't you give General Meade credit instead of picking out why General Lee didn't fight a good battle and point to his subordinates as the ones to blame for him losing the Battle of Gettysburg. Now that's all pause of the lost cause myth, and one I don't have time to take up with you today. Thank you so much. purposely left some quest time and if we have one of the red shirts around here and they have a mic since one of the fallacies of getting old you don't hear your hearing isn't acute uh, so they'll repeat your questions if you have a question are there any questions for Mr. Bars I think they're mesmerized. <laughs> All right, I'll make one more. They had a seminar at Gettysburg College about eight, about 10 years ago. And it was heavily weighted to people being on it who believe that Lincoln walks on water. And at the end of the program, which there were about 10 participants, everybody was in agreement that Lincoln's expect expectations represented an impossibility. He was giving General Meade something that with the means of communication, the means of warfare at that time would have been impossible to carry out. And if he'd been a general under Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler, Meade would have probably gone to a uh, 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 happy hunting ground long before he does. Would Ulysses S. Grant have driven Lee from the soil, or would he have known the difference? What was that again? Would Ulysses S. Grant have driven Lee from our soil, or would Ulysses Grant have really known the difference and attacked Lee? General Lee, like General Meade, will, at his own decision, not being goaded by General Halleck, will request of President Davis that he accept his resignation as commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. And Davis will politely, re uh, Davis will politely re decline to accept Lee's resignation. 
Lee will become a demigod, of course, after he's passed to his reward on the uh, Columbus Day of 1870. And that's when you have the birth of the lost cause myth. I think that's all the questions we have today, um, or the, all the time we have for questions today. But uh, Mr. Bars will be signing books uh, following his talk. Uh, please join me in thanking Mr. Bars. <laughs>